guys. So this is your ecology video notes for this unit. So we're going to talk about organisms and their relationships, energy flow, community ecology, and lastly, human impact. So first, organisms and their relationships. So something you need to know is, first of all, ecology is simply the study of the relationship between organisms and their environment. There's two different types of factors that we're going to discuss, biotic factors and abiotic factors. So biotic factors, bio means living, those are your living factors, plants and animals, and in this case, specifically animals is what this course is about. Abiotic factors are those that are non-living, so things that can impact your biotic factors but are not living themselves, such as sunlight, temperature, or water. So there's levels of organization that you need to know about in ecology. So we start at the lowest with organism here, and then we end with biosphere, which is the most broad. So an organism is simply that, just a single organism. A population is a group of organisms. A community is a group of populations. An ecosystem is a group of communities, but also includes those non-living things. And then a biome is a group of ecosystems that has the same climate and then a biosphere is the whole planet. So some definitions, if you haven't done your vocabulary yet, you can pause here and copy these down. They're the ones we just went over. Some interactions that you also need to know about. So two things that are commonly confused are habitat and niche. So habitat is just the area where something lives. The niche on the other hand is the specific role that organism has. So let's take a look at the picture. So it shows flamingos, for example, are here, and they feed by straining mud through their bills. They're obviously in the deeper water that you see. Now up here we have plovers, which hunt for small insects, and they're way up here on the sand. So all of these things occupy the same habitat, but they all have a different niche in the environment. So competition and predation are also two common things. So competition is simply that, competing for resources. Predation, on the other hand, is when one thing eats another thing. So that's how it gets its food and its source of energy. Some other relationships, so symbiosis in general is going to be that relationship between any two species. But there's three kinds. So there's mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. And we'll go over these more in class. But these three are very, very common, and you need to know the difference between them. And we'll also watch this YouTube video in class. So energy flow. I'm sure you've heard of autotrophs and heterotrophs. So remember, auto prefix auto means self. So those are the producers. Those are the plants that make their own food. The heterotrophs, on the other hand, are the consumers. They have to consume other organisms to get their food. Types of heterotrophs. So an herbivore is something that eats plants, such as, really can't spell it very neatly here, a rabbit. A carnivore eats meat, so this would be a lion. An omnivore eats both. Bears are great examples of omnivores. And detritivores, so these eat decomposing plant, animal, and fecal matter. So wood lice, slugs, sea cucumbers, fiddler crabs, even vultures. And those are different from decomposers. So there's some models of energy flow that you need to be familiar with. The first is a food chain, and I'm sure you all know what a food chain is. So it's a very simple model that just shows how energy flows through that ecosystem. So we start with the producer, move on to the herbivore, then the omnivore, and ending with the carnivore. The food web, on the other hand, is just many interconnected food chains. And the pyramid is essentially the food web in pyramid form, but it shows the energy level as well. And it's important to remember that energy always decreases as it moves up the energy pyramid. So there's trophic levels in a food chain or a food pyramid, and these should be review for you from freshman year. So the first level is your producers. They are the foundation of your pyramid. Next up, I'm going to write that real quick, so make yourself a note that the first level producers are always the foundation. Next up is the primary consumers. So these are the animals that eat the producers. Secondary consumers are usually omnivores. They can eat the producers, but they also eat the primary consumers. And then there's your tertiary consumers, which are carnivores. And some food chains and food pyramids have a quaternary consumer, and this is simply a larger carnivore that eats smaller carnivores. So here's a couple examples of some food chains. So we have three different biomes that you'll see across the top here. 
So the grassland biome, so we start with our primary producer, then our primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary, and this one has a quaternary. So as you can see, snakes are carnivores, but a hawk is also a carnivore that eats the smaller carnivore. The food web, on the other hand, as you can see, is multiple food chains. So we can start here, and then we go to the grasshopper, and then we can go to the mouse, and then to the fox. We can start here, and you can go straight to the rabbit, or you can go to the squirrel, then the fox. If you go to the rabbit, you can do rabbit, snake, owl. So that one has your quaternary consumer. The energy pyramid, like I said, this one shows how the energy decreases as you move up the pyramid. And what these numbers over here mean is it's just the amount of energy needed to sustain that one animal. So a thousand kilograms, you need a hundred kilograms, or it can only handle a hundred kilograms of herbivores, only handle 10 kilograms of that wolf or fox, whatever it is there, and then only a kilogram of a lion. So it's the powers of 10, so it decreases by a multiple of 10 every time you move up the energy pyramid. So community ecology. So let's review what is a community. So at this point, you should have the definition for a community. So remember that it's a group of populations that lives together. So there's limiting factors on a community, and those can be abiotic or biotic, which we discussed earlier. And what that simply does is it restricts the numbers, the reproduction, or the distribution of those organisms. So your abiotic factors are things like the amount of sunlight, the climate, the water, fire, etc. But other living things also are limiting factors such as disease, competition, and predation. So there's two categories, density independent and density dependent. So your density independent is a factor that does not depend on the number of animals in a population. These are usually your weather events, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, fire, or even humans altering the landscape and pollution. So a forest fire isn't going to purposely pick the forest that has the most species in it and choose to start in that forest. It doesn't matter how many species or how few species live in that forest, the fire will impact everybody. Density dependent, on the other hand, depends on the members in the population. So biotic factors, disease, competition, parasites. Think about, in this example, third world countries, right? Those people suffer a lot because of disease and they don't have the proper nutrition or the proper sanitation. So that's a density dependent factor because the more people you have, the more problems you have, and then that overall impacts your population number. Population growth rate is something you also just need to be familiar with the terminology. So PGR, or population growth rate, is just how fast it grows. And zero population growth is basically when birth rate equals death rate. And you should know what birth rate and death rate mean, but just in case, here's a couple definitions for you. So the rate of birth versus the rate of death in a given population. There's also two types of strategists that you need to be familiar with. So in our strategists, those are your organisms that are used to being in an unstable environment. So they are usually small and they don't live very long and they have lots of babies. So as you can see, this rat in this picture, I can't even tell how many babies that rat has, but it has a lot. And generally, most of them don't make it to maturity, but that's kind of how that species works. They're an R strategist, they're used to an environment that isn't very stable, so they make lots of babies in the hopes that one or two make it to adulthood. Your K strategist, on the other hand, is used to a stable environment, and these are the types of organisms that really, really struggle with all the human impact issues and the poaching and the pollution and the habitat destruction because they don't have offspring very often. And when they do, it's the expectation that that baby does reach adulthood and go on to reproduce more for the species. So it's a long lifespan, usually one, two, maybe three offspring. And humans are actually also considered case strategists, even though some people have lots of babies. But in general, they don't have very many offspring. The final thing we're going to talk about is human impact. So as you can see, if you look at this graph, the global temp and the carbon dioxide. So as the global temperature has gone up, the carbon dioxide has gone up. There are people that still think that global warming is a hoax or it's a government scandal or whatever you may have heard. But the reality is it's real and it's happening and it will impact us in the future or maybe your children or grandchildren, but it will have a significant impact one day. So humans, we have some problems. So we create 
an invasive species issue by transporting species to other areas where they don't belong, whether that's knowingly or unknowingly. We put animals in captivity, poaching, species extinction, hunting for ivory, pollution, of course, and global warming and the greenhouse effect, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Deforestation, so we're destroying their habitats. We see this daily around our school. Just take a look at how many places maybe used to be a meadow or a forest when you were in elementary school and now it's a subdivision. Also, two important terms, biomagnification and eutrophication, which we will also talk about. So here's just some pictures of human impact. So you can see up here, these are zebra mussels, and they are impacting a lot of lakes up in the north. So this is something that I was always very familiar with growing up. You always checked your boats to make sure you didn't transport zebra mussels to a different lake. Um, you see down here, I'm sure you've heard about the snakes in Florida. So the Burmese pythons were people's pets that they released, and now they're eating the wildlife that's endangered. Um, of course, captivity and poaching are also here. Some more human impact. I'm sure everyone's seen the picture of the polar bear on the melting ice cap. And then we have pollution. If you've been following anything in South America, you'll know that there's lots of issues with water quality down there and finding sewage and antibiotic resistant bacteria and all sorts of things in the water. And the greenhouse effect. So this is a huge problem. So how this works, and I, if I were you, I'd take a minute, just kind of pause and study this picture so you can understand a little better. But there's excess amounts of gases that we release, whether that's through burning fossil fuels, through our cars, through deforestation, all of those things are causing excess. So more gases create a larger barrier. So there's basically this air barrier around the planet that is functioning like a greenhouse. So it's raising the global temperature. The other thing I'm going to talk about is bioaccumulation or biomagnification as you may hear it. So this is just simply the movement of toxic substances up the food chain. So your top carnivores have the most toxins. So if you look in this picture, you'll see that the otter up here has a much bigger red dot than say the plants down here. So as the big fish eats little fish, that's going to increase the amount of mercury in the big fish. And we as humans, what do we eat? We eat the big fish. And we'll also watch a movie about dolphins and how dolphin meat is being sold in schools. And it's actually causing mercury poisoning in the students because it ha dolphins have so much mercury in their bodies. And finally is eutrophication. And this is something that you should be really familiar with because it's there's a lot of algae blooms and everything going on right now. So it's creating issues in the water. So eutrophication is the excess buildup of nitrogen and phosphates in the water from pollution or water runoff. And what that does is it creates an algae bloom to where the water is no longer available for the fish. So if you get all this algae on the surface, it blocks the oxygen, and then the fish aren't getting the oxygen, and then they die. And then, of course, it creates a horrible smell. So eutrophication is a huge, huge problem, and we will talk about this further as well because it is so prevalent right now. And that is it for your notes. We will also look at this video in class.